Hi, and welcome to Harvest Bible Chapel, Kuala Lumpur Online. We hope that the following message will be a blessing to you as you seek to walk with the Lord in spirit and in truth. For more information about our church, please visit www.harvestkl.org or click the link in the description below. This weekend, we are going to be in the book of Daniel, and so if you have your Bibles, I invite you to go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. In the book of Daniel, God's people are still in exile in Babylon, and Daniel and his friends, as promising young men, are chosen to spend time in the king's court to learn about the culture and the language of the Babylonians. And we're going to be in chapter 6 today, but I want to encourage you to go back this week and read chapters 1 through 5, because there is a lot that is happening there, a lot, that, but we just don't have the time to get through all of that today. But as we look at Daniel, there's so much parallel for us, because like Daniel, as believers, we are living in this world as exiles. We are exiles in this world. And I'm not just talking about as expats living in a country that is not our own, I'm talking about all of God's people who are looking forward to an eternal city, to all those who have faith in Jesus and a temporary citizenship to different countries here in this world, but we are ultimately citizens of Jesus' eternal kingdom. And Daniel's life, as we look at it, we can learn a lot about what it looks like to thrive in a place and to be sent to a place that is not our forever home. So by the time Daniel 6 happens, Daniel is an old man. He's probably like 80 years old. And the Babylonians who took God's people into exile are no longer in power. The Medo-Persian Empire is in charge. And this is where we pick up in verse 1, Daniel chapter 6. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. And over them three high officials of whom Daniel was one to whom these saint traps should give an account so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became as distinguished above all the other high officials and saint traps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Now I want you to notice how Daniel is being honored here. Similar to Joseph in Egypt, Daniel is being raised to second in power over the entire kingdom because he is trustworthy and he is skilled. He has an excellent spirit in him. And so in all that he does, he is excelling. Now, Daniel could have had a rebellious spirit about him because his people are in exile, but instead he's deciding to trust God. And he is believing that God is still at work, that God wants to use him in his grand plan because it is oftentimes in these hard times that God does his best work. And so Daniel doesn't get discouraged, and instead he digs in and he obeys God's command to his people to live as exiles and to seek the welfare of the city, to be engaged in the work of the city and to pray for the city because God tells his people that while they're in exile, if they seek the welfare of the city and the city prospers, then his people are going to prosper. Now, there's an entire sermon that can be preached on that alone, but because of time, we're just going to have to leave it at the fact that we should be as citizens and residents of this world, hardworking, excellent, productive, and engaged people, and most importantly, people who are about the work of prayer and for the people of KL. Now, that means we have to know our city and not just go about busy with our own lives. We have to know what is broken so we know where we can serve, and that is how God will bring welfare and joy to the city. That's how we will thrive. Let's keep going. Verse 4. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for a complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could not find no ground. They could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. So the other officials are envious of Daniel and they want him out. But Daniel was so faithful and above reproach at his job that he didn't have a hint of drama. There was no dirt that they can dig up on him. Now, that's pretty amazing because he's been in public service for decades and there was nothing in his character that they could go after. I don't know how much, uh, if we could say that about many of our political leaders today. Let's keep going. Verse 6. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. 
All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and satraps, the counselors and the governors, agreed that the king should establish an ordinance to enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. So the king, after his officials have puffed him up, have made him think foolishly too high of himself, he makes his plan and he signs off of this injunction. Now, that is often how we also get into trouble. We think too highly of ourselves. We're a little bit too hasty. We don't think things through and we just jump into it. That's what the king did. Verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem, and he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had previously done. Uh, you got to love Daniel for this, right? This decree goes out that no one's allowed to pray to anyone except for the king, and what's he do? He goes and immediately disobeys. He breaks the decree. And he doesn't just pray once to God, but three times a day. And he's apparently praying out loud, or else the satraps, these officials, wouldn't know to which God he was praying. So Daniel wasn't trying to hide anything. He wasn't going to allow this decree to change anything about his prayer and worship of God. And also, did you catch that Daniel prays a prayer of thanksgiving after this decree comes out? What? Why is he giving thanks for this decree that he should not be able to pray to any other god but the king? He's not worried or panicked about this decree or his life. He just goes about his normal business because the sovereignty and the faithfulness of God is at the forefront of Daniel's mind, not this decree, not his situation. We often, we do the opposite. We allow our hard situations to define us and who God is, and it determines our reactions. Maybe it's with a job loss, a loss of a loved one, or when an accident or tragedy happens, we often say, God, what are you doing? Don't you know what you're doing? It seems like you don't. Why are you letting this happen? Don't you care about these things? A loving and sovereign God surely couldn't allow this to happen. They couldn't be a part of this. And I know that because I've been there. I've had those same reactions. But Daniel here is cool. He is unfaced because of his trust in God. And as we go through the rest of this story, I want to point out some things about Daniel and how he approached prayer and show you how it was Daniel's prayer life that kept him so grounded and steadfast in his faith. This is number one. He saw that prayer was vital for spiritual health. Prayer was vital for spiritual health. Notice the trap that was set was not you couldn't sing a worship song and it wasn't you couldn't read the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that reading the Bible or singing worship songs are any less important. No, the Bible and the Holy Spirit illuminating the Scriptures to us is the foundation of our prayer because we are responding in prayer to what God has already revealed about Himself, what He has already spoken to us from His Word, and it should revoke a response of worship and singing to God, but our prayer is our lifeline to communicate back and forth with God. And without prayer, without a prayer-filled life, no one is as mature or as close to God as they think. Because number two, prayer is communion with God. You know, Daniel could have easily said, you know what, this injunction, it's only for 30 days. This is not for my lifetime. So for these next 30 days, I can actually, I can wait this out. I can redeem my time by doing something else. I can do lots of ministry in the time that I was spending praying. But no, Daniel knows that prayer is critical to his closeness and his relationship with God. Now imagine if you are married in this room that you weren't allowed to talk to your spouse for 30 days. Some people in here might be excited about that idea. I think my my wife might be actually one of them. But your relationship in this scenario, you would slowly drift apart because you wouldn't not just be talking with one another or listening and understanding one another, but you wouldn't really be spending time with another person. And these things are critical for a thriving relationship with someone. Now, I talk to the married people. Imagine you are single and you're trying to go on a date on dinner, at dinner with someone. And you're trying to get to know them, but the only rule was 
you can't talk to each other. How successful would that date be? It'd be terrible. See, prayer is like that. It is communion with God, and you cannot have closeness with God unless you have a prayer-filled life. Number three, prayer is discipline. Prayer is discipline. See, Daniel didn't start praying when the decree came out and things got hard. He continued to pray three times a day, the text says, as he had previously done. A lot of times we live our lives as if we've got everything under control and we want God to stay out of our way until a moment arises where we need his help. We need something from God. And then we treat God like a genie and say, God, I need this provision from you. I need this help from you. I need this deliverance from you. And at all other times, we're like, you can actually stand to the side. At all other times, I really don't need you in my life. But God says that he is the God of the universe. And he's the Lord of our lives who desires a consistent relationship with us. Number four, prayer is humility and dependence on God. A text says, Daniel got down on his knees to pray. Now, I don't know about for you, but oftentimes when I get ready to pray, I'm not getting down on my knees, but to be completely honest, I'm getting comfortable, right? Especially if I feel like I'm going to pray for a long time, there might be pillows involved, and there might be some resting in the Lord involved, and the prayer time turns into a nap time, right? Anyone, can anyone sympathize with that? But Daniel gets down on his knees to pray. Now, to be clear, there is no requirement for us that we have to get down on our knees to pray, but it certainly shows a heart posture that is humble and desperate for God. And what I've found in my experience is that oftentimes my physical posture will lead my heart. Now, do I want to naturally love God so much that I just want to get down on my knees and pray? Yes, I would love if that were the case all the time, but it's not. So when I make myself get down on my knees and pray, oftentimes what will happen is my heart will follow my physical posture. And as I get down on the ground, I will have a better perspective. My heart starts to see how small and powerless I am and how much I need God. It puts both me and God in right perspective. Now, my guess is that Daniel, in his time in prayer, as he got down on his knees, it wasn't rush. Because when you get old, let's just be honest, it's hard to get back up. And so when you get down on your knees, you don't just get down on your knees real quick to just get back up. He's probably devoting himself to this time with God. I love this quote by Martin Luther. He says, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. I have so much to do in my day today that I cannot afford to give, go about doing all that I need to get done until I've spent the first three hours in prayer. Now, that is a posture of humility and utter dependence on God. Let's keep going. Verse 11. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that everyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the lion's den. The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. They've got Daniel. Their plan is working. Verse 14. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. So the king is trying to figure out a way to reverse what he's done because he has been tricked into something that he doesn't want to do, but there's nothing he can do about it. Verse 16, Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the lion's den. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. So Daniel was so indispensable to the king, so important to the king, that the king is up all night praying and fasting that God would deliver him. 
And again, notice that even the king knew of Daniel's faithfulness to God. He knows that Daniel is serving his God continually. He has a real and meaningful relationship with him, not just as someone that he's seeking in hardship. Okay, verse 19. Then at at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives, And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Just in case anyone thinks that God didn't actually deliver Daniel, the lions were obviously hungry. What an amazing story of how Daniel trusted God even in the face of death. And here's the fifth thing. Prayer demonstrates and builds trust in God. Prayer demonstrates and builds trust in God. A couple of chapters earlier in Daniel, but this would have been many decades before, Daniel's friends faced a similar test, which I'm sure that Daniel heard about. His three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, had a decision whether they were going to bow down to another god or be thrown into a fiery furnace. They, of course, chose the furnace But what they said as they faced the furnace is truly amazing. Daniel chapter 3, verse 17 and 18 says, they say, If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. That's just awesome. And Daniel, like his friends, having built up trust in God over years and years of prayer and communion with his God, he's able to trust God both in life and death. And so what's he do when he's faced with this decision, this problem, even if it means death, he turns and he prays to God. Let me ask you, what do you turn to in time of trial and hardship? For many of us, we turn to ourselves. We turn inward. And we're going to try to figure it out on our own. We're going to make it happen somehow. Others of us are going to get angry towards God and shake our fists at Him. Others of us will sink into despair and worry. Now, all of those things may feel right, but they never work out at the end. For those of us who are believers today, how much more can we trust God, the God who loves us and gave His Son for us and gave us eternal life through His Son's death and resurrection? And prayer, as we commune with God, will help build this trust that God knows what He is doing, that He is sovereign over all things. Number six, prayer leads to deliverance. Now, ultimately, Daniel is delivered by his prayers and his trust in God. Sometimes scripture makes us very clear that we don't have because we don't ask. We don't have any kind of desperation or genuineness of faith when we are praying to God. Now, without Daniel's prayer life, I don't think he rises to power in these kingdoms or has the faith to face death with confidence or is delivered out of death. His prayer led to trust in God, which led to his deliverance. So knowing what we do as believers today about our Heavenly Father and how He loves us and how He desires to give with us His Son all things, that He is a Father who loves to give to His children good and perfect gifts, we should pray and ask with boldness. We're going to come back to that at the end. Look at verse 25. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. 
His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So let's quickly break down Darius' prayer. I love how my pastor uh, back in the U.S. broke this down. Follow in the text with me. So from this short prayer, we see that, number one, God is global. This goes out to all peoples and nations and languages. God is personal. He's alive. He can be known and loved. He is living God. He's eternal, enduring forever. He's sovereign. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. He's faithful. He delivers and rescues. He's eminent, meaning that he is engaged. He works signs and wonders in heaven and earth, and he is Savior. He rescued Daniel. And that's a pretty awesome prayer itself. And then lastly, in verse 28, so this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And here's the last thing that we see about prayer from Daniel's life. Prayer produces faithfulness to God. Prayer produces faithfulness to God. Daniel's continual prayer through his lifetime was the reason that he was able to persevere through the hard times. It was his faithful prayers that produced faithfulness in him. Daniel's faithful prayers produced faithfulness in him. In chapter 1, Daniel had refused to defile himself with food and drink. He refused to compromise his integrity and faithfulness to God. In chapter 2, he seeks God in a time of trouble for deliverance when all the wise men in the land are about to be put to death. But God saves him and reveals the dream of the king through Daniel. In chapter 3, we've already talked about this. His friends have demonstrated faithfulness to God in the face of the fiery furnace. In chapter 4, Daniel interprets the king's dream again and calls the king to repentance. In chapter 5, Daniel again is called to interpret the writing on the wall because he is known to be someone of excellent reputation. So when Daniel 6 rolls around, Daniel wasn't doing anything out of the ordinary for him. Daniel had prepared a lifetime through prayer for this moment in the lion's den, and God was faithful in seeing him through. Uh, One of my interests, a lot of kind of this hole that I went to in researching several years ago was I took interest uh, because I was born on a military base. I was like, oh, what is this whole world? And long story short, one of the fascinating things that the military world, at least in the U.S., says is that you don't rise to the occasion. They say you, you fall to the level of your training. You don't rise to the occasion. You fall to the level of your training. And that we see that that is true in Daniel's life. And so do you want God to call you to do great things? Do you want to do great things for him? Do you want to experience God like Daniel did? Maybe not with lions, but although that would be really cool, something just as cool, right? If so, then you have to put in the work through prayer now. If you wait until the moment of trial or temptation or trouble to do, to decide what you're going to do, you will fail. You have to make that decision long before it happens, after time and time again of meeting with God in prayer. If you want to do incredible things for God that require lots of faith, If you're going to make a difference for God, then you have to be different and you have to be faithful in the small things like prayer. Because God oftentimes, before he will use you to do something big publicly for him, he wants you to do the work privately with him in prayer. And it's through all the consistency and faithfulness in prayer that you are preparing and you are being prepared for those big moments. Now, very quickly, I want to address what the opposite of a prayer-filled life is, prayerlessness. What does that mean? The root of prayerlessness in our lives is pride. It is self-sufficiency, and it's wickedness to God. At the heart, prayerlessness is the same sin that Adam and Eve committed in Genesis 3 when they decided to walk away from God, when they rejected Him and thought that they'd be fine without Him. They thought, we don't need God. That's what prayerlessness shows about our hearts and how we view God. So let me ask you this. If God were to, in one swoop, answer all the prayers that you prayed for the last 30 days, what would be different? If God said yes to all the prayers that you prayed, all the things that you asked him for in the last 30 days, what would be different about you and what would be different about this world? For a lot of us, I think if we're honest, we would have a better life. We would be a little bit more comfortable. We'd have a little bit more money. 
But would the world look different at all? Would the world be turned upside down? Would people and nations be saved to Christ? Would disciples be made? Would churches be planted? Would the kingdom of God advance here in KL and around the world? We've got to, as God's people, pray big prayers. Because when we pray, we are calling God to do something that we cannot do. We are not praying according to our ability, but we are praying to God who is able to do far more than we can ever ask or imagine. And through our prayers, we will be changed to be more like Jesus. Our lives will be transformed. We will have an intimate relationship with God, and it will change everything about us. It will change the way that we work, the way that we do ministry, the way that we raise our friends, raise our kids, not raise our friends. It will change everything about us. Maybe some of you got younger friends. But as I begin to close, I just want to make sure that none of us walk out of here thinking that somehow that Daniel is the hero of this story, because he's not. You see, Jesus is the better Daniel. Jesus had perfect communion with the Father because unlike Daniel, Jesus was sinless. And Jesus, not against his will, but willingly took on flesh and came to this world that he created that was not his home. And while he was on earth, he would regularly go away to a secret place to meet with his heavenly Father to spend in prayer. While we deserve to be thrown into the lion's den for our sin, Jesus was truly innocent, and yet he willingly entered into the mouth of death for us. And so we were spared the death we deserved. But God the Father would not deliver Jesus, even though he was blameless. He would be crucified for our sins, and his body would be buried in a tomb and sealed with a stone, so that we could be lifted up out of the pit. See, Daniel's deliverance from the lion's den was just a foreshadow of Jesus' resurrection. As Daniel was taken out of the lion's den, Jesus would walk out of the grave himself, not just having escaped death, but having conquered death, having defeated it once and for all. And so all of us who trust in Christ, we also can now have victory over sin and death. And so if you're a follower of Jesus today, what does this mean for you? It just means two very simple things, that you need to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, and you need to devote yourselves to prayer. There is nothing more important that you can do as a follower of Christ. And my recommendation to you is don't start off crazy. You heard a sermon on prayer and how vital and important it is. Don't go uh, this afternoon and say, okay, I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to pray five hours every day. Don't do that. That's not going to work. If you don't have a thriving prayer life, that's okay. Start with just five minutes and make it the first five minutes of your day. Carve out the time for it. Do it first thing. This is how we as believers are supposed to live in this world and thrive as exiles. With our relationships to God intimate and sent into the world and into our city for its good by praying and calling on God to move. My hope is that we as a people, my prayer is that we as a church would be known that we would be a people of prayer.